So good afternoon. Uh, welcome to QEEE course on air pollution control engineering. So myself, I am uh, Shivanagendra. I am a faculty in Department of Civil Engineering. About this course, I'll just uh, give you a, a brief overview. This course will be of uh, roughly about uh, uh, two and a half sessions. Where the first session will be discussed about the introduction to air pollution, then uh, the sources that contribute uh, uh, air pollution. Then uh, we also discussed about the scales of air pollution problems. Then we will try to find out how the air pollutants can be measured, uh, different techniques that are being used that will be covered in the first session. The second session will be discussed about uh, the air pollution meteorology, which is one of the important component which controls the air pollutant concentrations. Then we will discuss about uh, uh, the, the various models that can be used for addressing the air pollution uh, issues, then followed by the control equipments, which can be used for controlling the air pollutants. Then in the third session, a, a part of the third session, we will be discussing some special topics, uh, uh, basically try to use air pollution and, uh, uh, and uh, local climate, some interactions, then the local sensors uh, in using uh, personal exposure measurements. Coming to the today's session, we will be discussing about uh, uh, the air quality uh, problems associations and uh, the impacts. Let us, we have some uh, learning objectives the, to introduce the in this course the students to the facts of air pollution, principles, concepts and methods adapted in air quality management then the expected outcome from this course will be students should be able to grasp, grasp some fundamentals of air pollution and its associated environmental impacts and uh, try to learn and describe the key components of air quality management. The topics that will be covered in today's session, as I mentioned earlier, introduction to air pollution, sources of air pollution, then scales of air pollution, effects of air pollution and philosophy of air pollution control standards and legislations that has been that are being used in air quality management in india and we'll discuss about monitoring of air pollution so all of you uh, aware that uh, air pollution is a major concern and in particular most of the cities they are facing air, air, air pollution problems and there is increasingly a stress on public health in many cities across the world uh, across the world uh, uh, the air pollution problem is a serious concern the, then the question comes why it is so, then it is linked to a fast urbanization, industrialization and increase in number of vehicles. All of you know that the significant uh, uh, deaths happens because of exposing to the air pollutants in particular outdoor and indoor air pollution. How we can address this problem? Is it a, such a, a challenging problem we, we, we can't uh, find solution for this or what what in what way we can we can address this problem let us try to try to understand first with a, a definition the definition uh, says the air pollution is a, a contamination of uh, indoor or outdoor environment by any chemical physical or biological agent that modifies uh, the natural characteristics of the atmosphere okay so it means that here the pollutants that is important then the duration of exposure and toxicity and if you try to look at the system approach in defining the air pollutants. So there are variety of sources that contribute air pollution and the meteorology which controls the concentrations are try to bring the air quality in the ambient environment or indoor environment, then the receptors will be exposing to that. These pictures give an idea that what will be the composition of air and if you try to notice, so the carbon, mono, carbon dioxide concentrations is reported as 315. It means that it is several years back. So right now, the carbon dioxide concentrations somewhere around 360 to 370 ppm. Now, the concentration conversion is another important uh, uh, factor because generally the particulates, you know, the, the basically there are two types of pollutants. I'll go into discuss in the uh, after some time. The you, you can classify the air pollutants into two types, gaseous pollutants and particulate pollutants. Gaseous pollutants will be represented with a ppm, uh, parts per million, and whereas the particulates will be represented with mass per uh, known volume of air. 
So you may come across how to convert this uh, PPM to uh, microgram per meter cube. So you can use simple conversion to convert uh, parts per uh, million to microgram per meter cube. Basically, your molecular weight, uh, then uh, uh, your concentration in PPM divided by 24.5 if you are using it for converting in at a standard uh, temperature, I mean uh, 25 degrees centigrade. And if you are going for 0 degree centigrade, it will be 22.5. Now, coming to uh, different uh, eras of air pollution, air pollutions in the early uh, industrial era, basically a natural uh, uh, disasters like a volcanic eruptions that used to contribute significant amount of emissions. Now, pre-industrial era, there is a significant contribution from coal uh, emissions. Then early 20th century, significant emissions contributed by industrial activities. Now we are more about secondary air pollutions, then also relating to global climate change. Now, why to study air pollution? Air pollution is not a, a, a new phenomena. It is a day back, uh, date backs to uh, ancient times when fire has invented. Okay, so there are history of air pollution issues that has been reported indicating that uh, a, a, a continuous uh, a higher concentration of pollutants in a particular place and it's their effects. For example, in 1930, a three days fog in Meuse Valley, Belgium, uh, resulting into some significant health risks. Then similarly, if you try to look at uh, in, in India also, we had a, a air pollution uh, impact. Uh, you know, uh, Bhopal gas tragedy in 1984, release of methyl isocyanide uh, that caused uh, more than uh, thousands of deaths uh, because of release of this toxic gas. Now, first try to understand what is air pollution episode. An air pollution episode is generally occurs during critical periods. Critical periods here mean that winter period where the concentrations will be generally high. When the meteorological parameters such as temperature, pressure, mixing height, stability of the atmosphere, wind speed, direction remains unchanged for longer hours of the day. So as, as you notice, if they are not changing, all the pollutants which are releasing from the different sources, they will be all accumulating and hence the concentrations will be increases. In such conditions, generally the concentrations will be several times higher than the, the ambient air quality standards. So if this picture on your uh, uh, the mark I, I'm showing you, so if you notice that there is a significant concentration, increase in concentrations of the sulfur dioxide concentration and correspondingly we'll notice that there is a death increase in number of hospital admission and death. There are two types of episodes you can come, come across. You may notice that, okay, just uh, like uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in air pollution, the winters are the only critical periods where the concentrations will be significantly higher, but you will also notice that in summer, you will also come across air pollution issues. Say for example, ozone concentrations can be much higher during summer uh, because of photochemical reactions. Now coming to the sources of air pollutions, we can broadly classify them into two types, natural sources and anthropogenic sources. So natural sources, as I mentioned earlier, volcanic eruption, dust storms, forest fires, okay, pollons releasing from the plants and trees, uh, these are all coming under natural sources. Then coming to a man, anthropogenic or man-made man sources, so we can classify them into a point sources. Okay, for example, why we call it as a point source, where the emissions are coming from the fixed location or a fixed point. So example is industries, power plants, then area source, where the emissions are contributed by significant area. For example, open burning uh, or agricultural burning. So these are all an example for area sources. And mobile sources is, is an example is emissions con contributed by vehicles. Now these are some, some of the examples for your uh, uh, different types of sources. So this is an example for area sources, a forest fire or agricultural residue burning can be an example for area source. This is an example for point source. This is an example again, uh, because here the volcanic eruption, uh, significant area will be involved in emitting these particulates. So it will be, uh, this will be again uh, coming under area source. This will be emissions contributed by individual vehicles, which, which can be coming under vehicle or uh, mobile source. Now coming to uh, quantification of these sources, I already mentioned about so how to quantify? In an urban area, there are different types of sources contribute air pollution. You need to quantify them as a point source, just basically how much emissions are contributed by industries. Non-point sources are just like uh, all other sources, like uh, area sources where emissions contributed 
by open burning uh, or domestic uh, heating. Okay, these are all some of the emissions. We can put them under non-point source or area source. Emissions contributed vehicles can be under uh, vehicular emissions or mobile sources. Then some cases, some cities can also have something called other non-road mobile sources. For example, in the mobile source, we, we generally not account emissions contributed by trains so uh, or locomotives. So in such cases, you can also use other non-road mobile sources for uh, quantifying the emissions. Then you will come across a natural sources uh, where the emissions contributed by forest fires, dust storm, volcanoes. Now all of us know that if you try to look at uh, emissions contributed by different sources, for example, as I given earlier, you, you can classify the sources into a three broad categories, emissions contributed by uh, uh, domestic sources, traffic and industries. Now if you do an estimation, you will notice that about 60 to 70 percent of the emissions contributed by vehicles and about uh, 20, uh, 20 percent will be contributed by industries and 10 percent will be contributed by other sources or domestic sources. So this is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, comparable from different cities. So in general, you will come to an conclusion that in most of the urban areas, vehicles contribute significant amount of emissions. Now, how to quantify these emissions? This is a simple expression. We can use it for quantifying the emissions. Uh, here, emissions is equal to emission factor. For example, if you do any activity, if you burn one liter of fuel, how much emissions will be contributed? If I drive one kilometer, how much emissions will be contributed? If I burn one kg of wood, how much emissions will be contributed? So you can quantify the emission factor each of these activities. For example, if I burn one liter of uh, gasoline, what will be the carbon dioxide concentration or carbon monoxide concentration? Again, uh, if I use a diesel, what will be the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide concentration? You have an emission factor for different types of vehicles, different fuels that is already published in variety of agencies. Many agencies have published this document. You can, you can refer that and sometime the activity can be uh, what purpose. For example, if you are using a vehicle, you can use different types of vehicle uh, uh, that can be used for quantifying the emissions. For example, I, I take an, one example. So I, I want to quantify the emissions contributed by four wheeler, a, a car. So I will take an emission factor, the car manufactured in 2000, I will use that as a reference and try to look for what is the emission factor of 2000 year manufactured uh, car. So I will take that emission factor then multiply with the number of cars, then I will be able to find out some amount of load that is contributed. And similarly, now I want to quantify the same pollution load. For example, I am quantifying carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide emission factor, then I will take number of cars and quantify, I will give total number of emissions contributed by this number of vehicles. Now I am taking an another example, I am assuming that 50 percent of these cars have been fitted with catalytic converter. So it means that some 50 percent of the emissions are maybe less will be reduced in my quant total quantification. So I can use that as a percent control efficiency. If some vehicles or some activity which is having some emission control mechanism, then the load will also decreases. Okay? So you can have uh, 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 different uh, types of uh, projections in order to quantify from one, one year to other year. Now coming to uh, uh, this is uh, uh, gives uh, different types of uh, uh, personal exposure you will come across. So basically all our uh, air pollution control depends on these three, three important things. The personal exposure where an individual will get exposed to the air pollutants, occupational air exposure where the people who are working, a uh, group of people working in a particular area will be get exposed or community air exposure where the whole community will be getting exposed to the uh, uh, pollutants. Now, for example, for uh, personal exposure, an individual, for example, a police personnel who is walking uh, at a traffic intersection, he will be definitely will get exposed to the significant amount of emissions contributed by vehicles. For example, occupational exposure, where group of people working in a particular area will get exposed. Uh, 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 this is a construction site. Many people working in that area, so they may get exposed. Then community exposure, our Bhopal gas tragedy is one of the uh, uh, best uh, example where uh, a, a disaster can significantly impact on the whole community. Now coming to a classification of air pollution, there are two types of, uh, two classes you can, uh, you, you will come across. One is a primary air pollutants uh, where the emissions are directly contributed by uh, the source. Uh, the second one is a secondary air pollutants where it means that as the name indicates, uh, the, the primary pollutants interact with each other in presence of sunlight 
uh, then uh, they form into secondary harmful pollutants. Now, these are some of the examples for your uh, primary and secondary pollutants and primary pollutants carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, ox oxides of nitrogen, hydrocarbons and particulate matter. Coming to a secondary pollu a pollutant, ozone, uh, pan, pyroxyacetyl nitrate, photochemical smog, okay, then uh, your acid mist, okay, then aerosols. In addition, you also come across another type of emissions. For example, in the road, you will also significant amount of resuspension dust will be contributed. So, we call it as a fugitive dust, especially you will come across during in the construction site, resuspension during the because of the movement of the vehicle. So, the sources of fugitive dust as I have indicated, unpaved roads, okay, storage uh, area, demolition of buildings, okay, renovation of buildings, all this resulting into fugitive dust. So, one of the uh, quick uh, way to measure this fugitive dust is size distribution. And generally, fugitive dust size distribution is greater than uh, about uh, uh, 10 to uh, about 10, 10 micron or more than 10 microns. You also come across other type of uh, pollutants. Is now recently it is gaining uh, interest. This is we call it as an uh, bio aerosols. Especially you know that almost most of the wastewater treatment uh, located very close to an uh, urban areas or within the city. Okay, so these uh, wastewater treatment plants also contribute significant amount of bioaerosols. So, we, you can relate what type of bioaerosols that contribute and how it will affecting on the human being. So, bioaerosols bio sometimes pollens, dander, fungi, these are all other uh, types of bioaerosols you will come across. Okay, again uh, they cause allergies. Okay, in indoor environment uh, you will uh, come across uh, 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 many types of bioaerosols and sometimes they also link to uh, a sick building syndrome uh, where a group of people will get uh, affected because of the indoor uh, conditions. Now, I will move on to uh, the next uh, topic uh, on scales of air pollution problems. So, now if you try to uh, re recollect, the, we discussed about uh, uh, different uh, sources of air pollution. I will quickly recap the point source, area source and line source are mobile sources. Now, you can also try to relate whether the area source impact will be continental, it is for long distance or it will be local or it is at urban scale. So, in order to understand we need we should know that how to classify different scales of air pollution problems. If the air pollution problem is restricted up to 5 kilometers, then we call it as a local scale air pollution problem. If it is of the order of 50 kilometer, then it will become an urban, air, uh, urban uh, scale air pollution problem. If it is a uh, order of 500 kilometer square, then it will be a regional and tens of thousands of kilometer square, then it will become a continental, continental or country scale. Then if it is extends worldwide, then it will call it as a global. Now, quickly I try to recollect what are the examples you can give for local scale, urban scale, regional scale country or continental scale or global scale air pollution problem. So, these slides give you an idea. A local air pollution problem can be an example for emissions contributed by vehicles. So, these are all uh, low emissions, low, uh, emission, low uh, emissions from the low, uh, lower height or less height and uh, the emission impact will be only at the local scale. Then you will also come across uh, scales of air pollution problem in urban areas. For example, at city center you notice more pollution. Okay, as you move away from the city, you will notice that the concentrations will be less. So, especially the carbon monoxide concentrations or ozone concentrations, this will be kind of pollutants that are coming under city scale and also the visibility is also under coming under city urban scale. Then you will come across uh, another type of air pollution problem a scale is regional. So, where some of this uh, sulfur dioxide oxides of nitrogen which is uh, released because of the combustion they can convert to a sulfate and nitrate. Okay. So, this will be uh, uh, formed into a secondary particulates. Okay. So, this will be sub contributing to sometime acid rain. So, these are all coming under uh, regional uh, problems. Then coming to a continental uh, scale, acid rain again uh, uh, is a, another example for continental scale and, and uh, the example for global air pollution is you all aware of it uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Okay. So, they will circulate and uh, destruct uh, uh, ozone layer and uh, allow the UV light penetrating to the earth surface. Now, coming to effects of air pollution, 
so effects can uh, air pollution effects can related to human beings plants materials and animals quickly i'll show you some informations related to health effects of air, air pollution so basically you all aware of it if you are exposing to the elevated concentrations then it causes some adverse impact okay on material on human being on even on plant growth so this gives uh, some kind of a life cycle of uh, the pollutants that are contributing so uh, some some cycle coming to effects of air pollution on human health so you all notice that uh, there is a significant uh, increase in pollutant concentrations in many cities in, in in india especially the particulates concentration in many our capital city uh, were very bad uh, during uh, december so the, then there will be a significant increase in hospital admissions because of respiratory infections now coming to uh, some informations so you'll notice that uh, uh, there is uh, there are different sources that contribute significant uh, uh, population getting affected uh, to increase in pollutant concentrations the important factors here is the concentration then the duration and frequency of exposure and the age group so all this also matters in relating the air pollution impact to uh, human for example particulate matter the impact can be related to uh, respiratory illness lung disease pulmonary uh, infections you will also come across uh, uh, carbon monoxide nervous system Im uh, impact on nervous system oxides of nitrogen again uh, corrosive action okay mucous membrane uh, uh, infection oxides of nitrogen high and nasal irritation ozone and pan again it causes a uh, high and uh, respiratory tract irritation so like that uh, you will come across each pollutant uh, will have some some one or the other type of impacts uh, uh, sometime the carcinogens can be uh, ph poly aromatic hydrocarbons or lead which are contributed by uh, pollutants a variety of sources you also have we can also have two types of uh, health impacts one is acute impacts and another one is chronic impacts so acute impact is a, a very immediate uh, uh, effect uh, where you will uh, eye irritation headache these are all some example for uh, acute uh, health impacts then chronic uh, chronic health impacts is uh, uh, is something like uh, if you are getting continuously exposed to the uh, the, the poor air quality for longer time then your uh, lung capacity can re reduces and you may get into some type of cancer then coming to effects on plants uh, uh, it, plants can uh, uh, can have uh, as the concentration and the duration of exposure so it can start from a simple uh, uh, injury to death okay so there are different types so uh, uh, bleaching of uh, the, the the leaf uh, turning into hello so these are all some of the examples for the effects of air pollutants on uh, plants then effects on air pollutants uh, on materials so for example sp in, in particular uh, if you are exposing to sulfur dioxide okay so it will causes formation of gypsum and it will traps all the particulate matter and makes this the whole uh, material become black okay so sometimes if you are using a, a marble stone so then uh, subjected to deterioration uh, soiling uh, uh, and deterioration of limestone uh, which which you can notice in uh, our uh, marble structure taj mahal you also notice the effects of air pollutants on animals so there are fluorides arsenic lead and uh, given some significant uh, relations with their health impacts so this uh, tables gives you uh, some kind of a, a summary of all the different types of pollutants you will come across carbon monoxide sulfur dioxide oxides of nitrogen ozone lead and particulate matter and which is the source uh, that contributes significant amount uh, what are the health effects and welfare effects i have summarized this in this particular chart now so coming back uh, i just uh, introduced you uh, the, the different types of pollutants the different sources that contributes the pollutants then we look at uh, uh, the different uh, impacts that uh, these pollutants uh, are causing now we'll try to look for how to address this how to control them so there are two philosophy generally practice one is a, a strategic where uh, the emissions can be reduced over a long period of time another one is a tactical the, where the reductions can be immediate so i can i just wanted you to think about what is the uh, exam what what is the best example for 
a strategic uh, air pollution or emissions reduction. For example, you know that uh, uh, the emissions contributed by vehicles, now it has to be reduced. So immediate uh, uh, reduction is it's very difficult. So what you will do is you will try to bring out the Euro or birth stage emission norms and try to control them by 5 years, 10 years, 15 years like a, what we have adapted birth stage 1, birth stage 2, birth stage 3 like that. So that will be kind of a, a long term or a strategic uh, emission control. Coming to a tactical uh, emission control, you are already having an, uh, a recent experience like a Delhi is subjected to a tactical approach where they used odd and even uh, approach in order to reduce the emissions and uh, critical winter periods. So air pollution uh, control philosophies can also include emission standards. So you can, you can bring out a stringent, stringent emission standards in order to reduce the emissions in a particular area or you can also bring down uh, uh, air quality standards to uh, again uh, with a stricter uh, emission norms again to reduce, improve the air quality in that particular area. Emission taxes, so again people are uh, uh, some, some cases they are adapted where uh, uh, they can declare it as an, a low emission zone and if you want to use it you have to pay additional cost that area. Then you can also look for a cost benefit analysis or cost benefit standards in order to improve the air quality in particular area. Then coming to uh, air quality standards. First of all, you know that uh, uh, there is a, uh, two things, uh, uh, standards and criteria. Uh, standards are uh, prescriptive where you will going to prescribe what should be the limit for each of the pollutants whereas criteria is uh, set based on cause effect relationship. So uh, the criteria can changes as the new technology or the new informations are available. Again, this information will lead into a change in standards. So ambient air quality standards are designed to protect human health with an uh, adequate uh, margin of safety including sensitive populations such as children, elderly and, uh, and individuals suffering from respiratory diseases. So you will, you will notice that there are two types of standards we will come across. One is ambient standards and emission standards. For example, you need to control the emissions. So uh, you, you because the air pollutant concentration is, uh, uh, is, is subjected to uh, uh, both the source activity and the ambient conditions or meteorological conditions. So you, that is why you need to have two types of standards. Emission standards basically uh, is a set a quantity limits for various industries, vehicles. So this gives uh, some informations or table of different air quality standards. For example, I will just uh, try to relate it the particulate matter standards uh, here if you try to look at uh, for annual standards it is like 60 microgram per meter cube. For 24 hour average standards is about 100 microgram per meter cube, okay. So again we have a two types of uh, uh, classifications, industrial, residential and rural area and uh, other category is ecologically sensitive area and if you try to look at uh, both the cases uh, more or less it is same, 60 microgram per meter cube annual standards, 100 microgram per meter cube uh, uh, 24 hour average standards. Then coming to the emission norms, uh, India first adapted uh, idle uh, CO emission norms uh, for uh, petrol vehicles uh, in 1991 and later on there was a significant uh, development. In 2000 we started adapting uh, uh, Bharat stage 1 or uh, stage 2 or Euro norm 1 and uh, then uh, we, we also uh, started improving Euro, Euro norm 2, Euro norm 3 like that. Now, it is proposed that uh, they wanted to use Bharat stage uh, skipping, uh, 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 sorry, Bharat stage 6, skipping uh, Bharat stage 5 in, by 2020. So you will also come across some emission st uh, standards uh, for different types of uh, 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 industries. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, general emission standards for, uh, uh, for a particular industry. A particulate matter, uh, for example, the emission concentration should not be exceed 150 microgram per normal meter cube, okay. So like that uh, for different pollutants, so there is a standard specified for and similarly you have an equipment based emission standards where for example you have a thermal power plant and different height you can specify what will be the emission standards. Then coming to uh, legislations, we have a, a variety of very uh, good number of uh, legislations to manage environment. So particularly the 1981 AIR Act which uh, and uh, 1986 Environmental Protection Act deals with uh, air quality management. Then you also have a 1998 Motor, Motor Vehicles Act, again it also controls air emissions. 
some some other uh, acts can also related to air pollution are ozone depleting substance rule 2002 petroleum and natural gas gas rules and 2006 petroleum and natural gas regulatory board act i think uh, uh, i have discussed uh, about uh, uh, the 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 different types of uh, different types of impacts then i i have linked to uh, the various uh, uh, standards that are legislations that are available for control of these emissions okay i before i go to uh, measurements i quickly want to see if uh, anyone having any uh, questions or clarifications is it clear to all of you I, then i'll i'll proceed okay coming to a measurement of air pollutants uh, you know uh, uh, now i have introduced you there are primary pollutants uh, that are contributed by various sources now in this uh, section in this uh, session i'll dis discuss about uh, the different uh, techniques that are used for measurement of air pollutants okay for example uh, when you want to use uh, quantify the pollutants contributed by the variety of sources for example here in this case the emissions contributed by a stack from power plant so now we wanted to find out what is the concentration so as you all know that there are two types of uh, measurements one is a source measurement and ambient measurement now you recollect so i have mentioned about uh, there are two types of standards one is uh, ambient standard and emission standards so so emission standards to regulate emissions at the source and ambient standards to regulate the or understand the air quality at the ambient and relating to the health impacts and try to relate so which sources contributes a significant amount of air pollutants in the ambient environment so you know you need a source monitoring okay maybe for example a grab sampler anti sampler okay or your stack monitoring kit then you need to have a, a different types of instruments for measuring the ambient air quality so we try to look some criteria pollutants for example sulfur dioxide particulate matter uh, then oxides of nitrogen ammonia hydrogen sulfide so these are all uh, different types of pollutants we will come across now coming to uh, monitoring uh, uh, methodology so first you try to see that whether uh, how we can measure the pollutants for example pollutants coming from a, a stack how to measure them so we can use uh, different uh, types of samplers passive sampler active sampler automatic sam analyzers and remote sensors let us try to look one by one so important question air quality monitoring is is basically you are trying to do carry out to understand what is the concentration of the pollutant in that particular area so then there should be a, a purpose for monitoring are you going to do a measurement for assessment and what is an objective for uh, uh, your monitoring then which approach you should use for air quality monitoring these three questions you need to ask before you start doing air quality monitoring so basic considerations a sample must be representative in terms of time location okay so for, if you are doing for an vehicular emissions so what time you will going to consider how long you will going to measure so if you try to look at the vehicular uh, emission uh, measurements you will notice so this will be your time scale and this will be the pollutant concentration i'm just using carbon monoxide i'm just assuming that vehicles contribute significant amount of carbon monoxide now if you try to look at if your time starts from 0 to uh, 23 hours so i'm trying to look at it maybe around 8 uh, o'clock and maybe in the evening 5 uh, uh, o'clock so you generally come across two peaks corresponding to uh, the peak hour traffic okay so so if you want to get a, a representative sample so you you need to uh, plan how long the pollutant concentration has to be monitored okay so again location if you are looking for a, 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 a traffic site measurement for example if you try to look at so this is a traffic site and if the predominant wind direction is coming from this where you would like to locate the monitoring station would you like to locate ear or ear so this makes some idea for you to understand where to locate the monitoring station then suppose i am i am i am i am trying to understand if there is a, a, a emissions contributed by a power plant now i am interested to locate okay there are different sources that contribute 
emissions i i would like to know at this receptor so what is the which source is contributing i would like to i am i am interested to understand which source is contributing at this receptor so you assume that there is a power plant emissions there may be movement of some vehicles okay so uh, near this uh, uh, receptor i assume there is a building and uh, there are many activities that are happening in that particular area now if you want to do it uh, uh, to if you are interested to understand which source is contributing then probably you you you, you would like to you are interested to how much or what is the amount of sample we need to be collect so that comes is or the sample is large enough for accurate analysis then you also should look at what is the sampling rate for example if i am going for an exposure monitoring then what should be the sampling rate if i am going for chemical analysis what should be the sampling rate so you should also try to consider those informations then duration of sampling is another important aspect as i mentioned to you one hour sampling four hour sampling eight hour sampling so you need to be look at those also consider uh, uh, those factors uh, in while while designing the sampling generally continuous sampling is preferred the, just as i mentioned to you if you continuous sampling if you take we will able to even get a signature of how the pollutant concentrations varies uh, uh, during the different time periods okay and uh, pollutants must not be altered suppose if you are capturing the uh, pollutants in the field and you are bringing uh, to the laboratory for subsequent analysis it should not be altered that's why you, you should be very careful in uh, in storing the sample uh, and also carry a blank sample in order to understand are there any uh, interferences uh, in in the measurements now there are different types of uh, sampling you will come across uh, extractive sampling where it means that uh, you 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 do the uh, measurements in the field and then uh, you you bring the samples and do uh, subsequent analysis by extracting the the samples so that one example is a bubblers so what you will do is you will come across maybe uh, 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 in many lab where you will try to see that uh, for example oxides of sulfur and oxides of nitrogen will they will use impinger to capture uh, through absorption then after once the solvent is uh, uh, captured all this the concentrations of the pollutants then you carry it to the lab and uh, do subsequent analysis the other example for again for an extractive sample is for example you are interested to measure the volatile organic compounds the volatile organic compounds uh, you what you will do is you will going to use some sorbent tubes or then you try to uh, capture this hydrocarbons that are existing in that particular area or vocs then you bring to the lab and then uh, you try to uh, extract okay using uh, uh, hard digestion method or the, to some solvent uh, or using some acid you try to extract them then you try to pass it through uh, uh, chromatograph to understand what are the different types of uh, uh, compounds that are present so this is this this is an example for uh, your extractive sampling then coming to an in situ sampling where uh, you will use some analytical technique it's like for example high end equipments will be adapted to look to to understand what is the concentrations on real time basis so continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations are some one example for in situ sampling then you also come across something called a passive sampling in this case you know uh, uh, first try to understand the difference between passive sampling and uh, active sampling a passive sampling is uh, uh, one where uh, uh, you you will not going to use uh, uh, any uh, mechanism uh, to uh, make the flow Uh, of the air uh, through this uh, sampler uh, whereas in active sampling a pump will be used for example you, you will high volume sampler the pump will be there where uh, uh, the known concentrate known volume of air will be passed through your absorber uh, or your adsorber so then uh, our uh, other uh, instruments you will quantify what is the volume of air which is passed through that and based on that you are you are trying to estimate the concentration here in this case uh, the passive sampling where you will try to uh, use uh, some kind of an uh, uh, media where the pollutants will be get trapped uh, because of a concentration gradient uh, basically there are two principles they will be used diffusion and permeation okay so in the diffusion just as you know that concentration pollutant concentration move from higher concentration to the lower concentration so you can just expose this uh, uh, particular uh, tube a sampler tube then uh, what you will do is uh, the, what the uh, the uh, the air pollutant concentration which is higher in the outdoor environment will try to uh, 
uh, get in uh, trapped with this uh, uh, media then uh, once the the concentrations of the outer uh, environment and this media will same then uh, the, the exchange will stop okay so these these are the two types that are generally used in passive sampling system so i just wanted you to uh, give some some informations on uh, uh, the different types of particulates you will come across the total suspended particulate matter uh, where all the uh, particulates that are suspended in air they call it, call it as a total suspended particulate matter which size ranges even up to 50 micron micron meter then pm10 basically particles of size less than 10 uh, micron diameter pm2.5 basically uh, particles of size less than uh, 2.5 micron diameter and uh, you also come across recently now people are uh, focused even look for ultra fine particulates anything with uh, particulate di diameter less than 0.1 microns i already mentioned about uh, the different types of uh, air pollutants measurements ambient measurements and source measurements and we also discussed about uh, the representative samples in terms of monitoring site sampling height flow velocity how many samples this is another question how many samples to be collected uh, so that's another question uh, uh, need to be clear again depends on what purpose we are going to uh, carry out monitoring then uh, we also in terms of concentration you can use uh, real time instrumentations uh, for measuring the concentration or you can also use uh, the high volume samplers measure it for known period and get it averaged and get an average concentration so this figure gives uh, an uh, some uh, uh, sampling train so basically how the sampling uh, equipment has to be connected or what are the components involved the sampling train involves uh, a probe which basically uh, draws the uh, flow from from the stack or uh, from the source so then uh, uh, it will be passed through a, a different absorbing uh, solute uh, solutions for example if you are interested to measure uh, different types of uh, pollutants carbon uh, uh, sulfur dioxide oxides of nitrogen so each uh, uh, representative uh, respective uh, solvent can be used to in order to capture the sulfur dioxide or oxides of nitrogen concentrations that are present you can also use uh, some uh, filter in order to capture the particulates that are existing in the emissions so for the sampling train you need a probe then an impinger and also a gel in order to uh, 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 remove the dryness then it will be having a pump then it will be uh, passing through the, the meter rotate, uh, rotameter to measure the volume of air which is uh, passing through this uh, uh, the sampling train so these are the some of the components uh, that are existing in the sampling uh, or the any of the sampling kit uh, your stack emission stack measuring stack emission measuring kit now coming to uh, uh, types of uh, uh, ambient uh, monitoring stations so all of you know that uh, there are seven types of sorry six types of air, uh, air air pollution monitoring stations type a stations also called as uh, downtown or pedestrian exposure stations uh, generally uh, 5 meter curve uh, to 2.5 meter to 3.5 uh, meter from the ground level so this is the location of the stations you will going to come across so you will use uh, these kind of stations uh, if the traffic flow is greater than uh, 10,000 vehicles per day. You will also come across a type B stations, a da downtown neighborhood exposure station. In central, in central business district, uh, uh, congested but not a congested area. The congested area will be coming here in the type A station. Uh, less high rise buildings and uh, vehicles is less than 500 vehicles per day. So in such cases, uh, you, 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 you classify them as a, a type B station. And type C station is basically a residential uh, uh, station, uh, population exposure station. It's also called as a, a residential population exposure station in the, middle, uh, in the middle of the residential area. Okay, this station should have at least uh, uh, 100 meter away from the street. So if you should notice that uh, if you put the station very close to the traffic site then it will capture the traffic emissions so you should make sure that it is about 100 meters away from the a traffic site then location of the station about uh, find 5 meter from that particular uh, uh, curve uh, make sure that it is not aff affecting on the free flow of the air and type d is a mesoscale station 
an appropriate uh, uh, height uh, to collect uh, meteorological and ambient air quality data. And all of you know that uh, 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 meteorological uh, uh, measurements will happen at uh, uh, 10 meter uh, height and we use that for our uh, uh, analysis. And type uh, E station is uh, a non-urban stations. In remote uh, or uh, non-urban stations, no traffic, no industrial activity. It is basically considered as baseline or background station. And type F station is a specialized uh, source uh, survey station. So basically, if you are interested to determine a particular uh, uh, emission impact, uh, uh, then we call it as an specified location uh, station. Okay, next comes uh, the number of uh, stations that, that need to be uh, identified. Uh, again, I will try to uh, use uh, some, some aspects. Okay, now consider there is a, a grid. So, in this grid, uh, 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 this will be a, this will be a residential area, and uh, there is an industry located here, and uh, you have a major uh, national highway passing through here. Okay. So now you also have a dump site. Okay, th this is not a good location for the dump site. So I'm this is this is a location dump site. Assume that wind is coming from this direction. How many stations should be should we plan in order to understand the impact of air quality in this grid? For example, here industrial emissions. I am putting one thermal plant. Now it is contributing emissions. The movement of vehicles is contributing emissions. How many stations? We can we can uh, we can look at it. So so generally, if you try to look at uh, so you you as I if you try to recollect, so uh, this will be the concentration and this will be the distance. So concentrations. Okay. So now, if you try to look at at the city center, you will have maximum concentration. As you move away from the city center, you will have less concentrations. Okay. So in this context, okay, if the wind is coming from these directions, so you would prefer to have one station here, okay. Then you would like to have one more stations within the residential area itself and try to understand what will be the concentrations and probably you would like to have one more stations at the, at the outside and try to link, okay. So what is the concentrations before the source? What is the concentrations? Maybe you can also have one station here, maybe which can be, you, you can avoid this station or you can have one station here. So what this will give you concentration at the source, then concentration at the receptor. So generally you need to have a minimum, a three number of uh, stations uh, uh, depending on the, the wind, wind conditions, okay. So, as I mentioned to you, the one station must be at the upstream of the predominant wind direction. The other two stations uh, must be at the downstream uh, downstream of the predominant wind directions. More than three stations can also be established depending on the area of coverage. As I as I indicated, you can have a more number of uh, stations uh, so that uh, you can you can uh, look at how it can be, uh, how, how, what is the characteristics of the emissions contributed by different uh, activities. Now coming to uh, the National Ambient Air Quality uh, Monitoring Program, so there are different uh, methods uh, used. Uh, let us try to look uh, uh, some uh, criteria pollutants. Uh, criteria pollutants are nothing but uh, where the cause effect relationship has been established. Uh, like the suspended particulate matter, PM10, PM2.5, sulfur dioxide, then oxides of nitrogen, carbon uh, monoxide, lead. These are all uh, criteria pollutants. So we have a standards for all these pollutants. And sometimes we also look for some specific pollutants. For example, recently there was an oil spill and may be interested to understand, okay, what will be the type of air pollutants that are generated because of this oil spills. So then you, you look for a specific type of pollutants. So different methods that are being used, uh, uh, for example, sulfur dioxide, uh, modified West KK method, then uh, oxides of nitrogen, Jacob method, Okay, so you will use the sulfur uh, SPM, so the particulate matter or respirable particulate matter, you use either a gravimetric or 
uh, light scattering principle uh, to measure the concentrations. I'll just explain quickly how uh, this uh, the sulfur dioxide concentrations are uh, are uh, are oxides of nitrogen uh, will be measured. What are the different principles that are being used? I'll going to explain in the so particulate matters uh, generally use the beta uh, ray attenuation uh, technique in order to measure the concentrations on a real time basis. Uh, then uh, chemiluminescence will be used for measuring oxides of nitrogen. Sulfur dioxide UV fluorescence they will use. Ozone again they use UV photometry. Carbon monoxide uh, non-dispersive infrared radiations method will be used. Uh, uh, benzene, xylene, toluene they use uh, again GC. And uh, total hydrocarbons FID technique, uh, flown, uh, flame ionization detectant uh, detector. Temperature, thermistors, relative humidity, capacitors, uh, barometric pressure, uh, pressure transducers, solar radiation, photocells, wind speed, anemometer, wind direction, potentiometer. So these are all uh, the different uh, uh, types of uh, 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 instruments that are being used for measuring air quality uh, in an urban area. Now let us try to look uh, 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 one of the example. Uh, how are where are we using these measurements? Basically, all these measurements uh, lead to uh, make some assessment. So they use something called exceedance factor. So you will come across something called uh, measured uh, concentrations. For example, every 24 hours concentrations you are measuring at a particular area and these concentrations will be averaged for all year and uh, then you are comparing with uh, an annual standard and uh, based on that you will make uh, classify the air quality under four categories. Uh, critically pollution when the your exceedance factor is greater than uh, 1.5 uh, highly pollution when the exceedance factor is uh, 1 to 1.5 moderate pollution if, if the exceedance factor is 0.5 to 1 and low pollution when the exceedance factor is less than 0.5 okay they use these informations uh, to declare a particular area as non attainment area for example, in uh, uh, our uh, Tamil Nadu, we had uh, the four uh, cities are considered as an, an non-attainment area. Uh, if you, for example, uh, we have Chennai, uh, Madurai, then Coimbatore, Tuticon, these are being considered as an, a non-attainment area with respect to a particulates pollution. Basically, a particulate matter concentrations are very high in those areas. And uh, now the question comes, uh, uh, okay particulates concentrations are very high in those areas then which source is contributing so if you notice in all these sources uh, all these areas vehicles are the major source contributing particulate emissions and in chennai because you know we have a major industrial area so so manali industrial area that also contribute industries also contribute some amount of emissions particulate emissions in chennai city Okay, now uh, before I, I move to uh, some of the instrumentation I would like to show to you. So let us try to look quickly how the, the measurements will be made in uh, particulates uh, in uh, high volume sampler. The information you look for high volume sampler uh, is try to you want to quantify the particulate concentration that are contributed uh, uh, from various sources. So you need to look uh, the one is the flow rate. Okay, so the cube is uh, something you need to quantify then uh, you are using uh, different types of filters uh, in order to quantify the particulates so you know you, you need to know the filter uh, weights so you need to have a initial weight of the filter that we call it as an w1 and then we will have a final weight of the filter w2 so you know the volume of air which is passed through this uh, filter filter paper okay so then uh, duration you know then you can find out the difference in initial weight and uh, uh, final weight will give you the mass mass of the filter that is collected over the filter paper so then you know the volume so you're going to get a concentrations in microgram per uh, meter cube okay so this is a, a simple way of uh, getting uh, the concentrations of the filter, uh, uh, concentration of the particulates in an ambient environment. Okay, coming to uh, particulates uh, emission uh, measurements, uh, uh, particulate uh, uh, will be measured at uh, uh, using different types of instruments. This is a high volume sampler, as I mentioned to you. 
um, uh, you, you, you will go into keep the filter paper here and try to uh, fix the, the flow rate. You also use uh, online technique uh, where uh, light scattering principle will be used. Uh, real time, the data uh, will be captured here uh, as the air passes through this, uh, depending on the, the, the radiation, the, the scattering of the, the particles. Uh, then it will capture the information and uh, quantifying into number of particles that are present in the given air. You can also use the Andy sampler for uh, quantifying the, the particulates and also the gaseous pollutants present in the ambient air. And this is uh, uh, another uh, very interesting uh, uh, air, air pollutants uh, measurement uh, equipment. It, this measures, uh, this we call it as an, a cascade impactor. A cascade impactor as an eight stage uh, which uh, uh, resemblance to our uh, respiratory system. So you can have uh, different size distributions, for example, uh, ranging from uh, uh, 10 micron to uh, even uh, 0.1 or 0.2 micron. So it's possible for you to uh, classify and uh, understand the distribution of uh, particulates uh, in the different uh, stages. So this is very useful for uh, respiratory uh, or exposure assessment uh, studies. You will also come across a, a, a Grim, uh, the organic vapor samplers. So basically, you will going to use uh, this instrument for measuring uh, your uh, organic uh, pollutants, uh, your uh, VOCs or hydrocarbons that are existing in that. You can fix this flow rate and duration of sampling. So then uh, once the, the pollutants captured here, can be subsequently used it for analysis. Uh, the other type of instruments uh, will be FRM sampler. Uh, the FRM sampler uh, basically uh, uses uh, uh, for speciation, uh, try to understand. So if you wanted to identify which source is contributing. Uh, in this example, uh, okay, at this point at the residential site, okay, so if I, I notice there is a, a particulate matter concentration, say about 100 microgram per meter cube. Okay, now my question comes here, this 100 microgram per meter cube, how much is contributed by industry? Okay, how much is contributed by traffic? Okay, how much is contributed by this dump site or maybe within the residential emissions? So we, we are interested to quantify, okay, what is the percentage contributed? Is it, uh, is it 25%? Is it 60 percent? Is it 15 percent? So like that, we are interested or is it 10 percent from here? So this may be interest. But all of you know that uh, the wind speed will never constant. So it varies from, uh, from time period, from one time to the other time. So in order to understand the concentrations, whatever we are measuring at this site, okay? So how much is contributed from the different sources? So that we call it as an, a source apportionment or apportioning the sources of particulates contributed in that particular area. So what we will do is for that, uh, uh, for that in order to understand that, so you try to collect the filter or the, uh, the, the particulate samples at this point, okay, then go for subsequent analysis. So this FRM sampler, one such instrument which uses uh, a PM 2.5 uh, uh, filter cartridge then uh, you can, b b before you know that uh, the filter paper has to be conditioned, generally you will keep it in a, a desiccator uh, for uh, uh, 24 hours to make it conditioned to the room temperature. Then uh, you will generally measure for 24 hours with a, a sampling rate of 6.7 liters per minute. And uh, you can, you can uh, uh, air flow rate can be uh, corrected with your temperature and pressure. So then you find out initial weight and final weight and look at what is the concentrations. So once the filters, you, you got it, you will know what is the mass that is collected on the filter paper. You know the particulate concentrations in that area, but you would like to know which source is contributing. For that, uh, you are doing some uh, chemical characterization. So you will take this filter paper and do some subsequent, uh, some chemical characterization of this filter paper and try to understand what are the ions that are present in the in the PM sample and also elements that are present in the PM, PM sample. And you know that each source will have a specific elemental compositions and ions compositions. So you can map those sources. So with respect to the, whatever the, the chemical characterizations, you got it at the receptor. 
or that the site then you map with the, the actual or the original uh, uh, emission source characterization or uh, chemical composition uh, signatures so then you will able to understand how much is contributed by uh, the different sources at that location then you will also come across a speciation sampler so something this is uh, again another interesting uh, equipment you will use uh, uh, different types of uh, you can use different types of filters for example you can use a, a nylon filter for ions teflon filter for metals quartz filter for uh, organic or elemental carbon so you can use a three types of filters so one filter can be used for uh, teflon one another sampling probe can be used for teflon filter nylon filter then quartz filter so you simultaneously you can able to measure okay so all the different types of uh, elements the are the compounds that are existing in the ambient air so here the sampling period is 24 hours sampling rate is 16.7 liters per minute so again once if you collected this filter papers as i mentioned earlier so you can extract the filter papers and do subsequent uh, uh, analysis so this is an uh, these are all some of the uh, informations related to uh, uh, filter papers generally the filter papers will be of size uh, 47 mm dia uh, with the 2 micron pore size uh, so this gives uh, some informations this is the quad filter paper nylon filter paper teflon filter papers and this is uh, this see look at this the black color indicates so much uh, particulates depositions in a given area uh, i'll just uh, I'll just uh, stop for a while uh, before uh, take up. I would like to take some questions now. Okay, so let us uh, take this question first. Okay, so sh should I answer this one? Okay, so you asked uh, one question was uh, what is meant by unit uh, ppm? Ppm is nothing but uh, parts per million. Okay, so it is nothing but parts per million. Okay, so conversion I have already given here. So you can use that conversion converting from parts per million to Microgram per meter cube. Okay, okay. This gives uh, uh, an uh, informations on ambient air quality standards. You have asked about uh, what is the level of concentration limit for uh, okay concentration for CO2. Okay, so I just uh, uh, this this will give and uh, some informations uh, on uh, uh, different types of uh, pollutants. Okay, for example, you asked about uh, carbon monoxide concentration carbon monoxide concentration the 8 hour average concentration is 2 mg per liter sorry 2 mg uh, mg per meter cube and uh, for 1 hour it is 4 mg per meter cube okay so for the both the areas so this is the concentrations uh, specified for uh, both industrial residential and uh, ecologically sensitive areas okay so as you all know that uh, uh, we don't have a standard for carbon dioxide because uh, uh, you know carbon dioxide there is no direct uh, health uh, implications okay so we don't have a, a limitation for carbon dioxide concentration okay so coming to uh, the scales of uh, air pollutions i think uh, what we are trying to look at in general uh, we are trying to understand the impacts of air pollution only at the about uh, uh, one kilometer height so there is a there is a no way uh, we can link the scales in the upper atmosphere so uh, i don't have any information to relate it but you can always uh, look at uh, the air pollution in stratosphere mesosphere uh, ionosphere maybe uh, but uh, we only look for in troposphere what is an air pollution levels okay so with respect to the troposphere then you try to look at uh, the vertical profiles uh, because there is not much information available to understand the impacts basically uh, we are focusing the air pollutants impacts on human beings vegetation materials uh, and uh, maybe on animals so all these activities uh, more or less happens less than uh, 100 to 200 meters uh, uh, from the ground level so uh, there is no uh, informations related to the scales of air pollutions but the scales of air pollution motion can be considered uh, uh, with respect to uh, different heights what is the best uh, suitable methods for measurement of air pollutants so i, I indicated to you that there are uh, different uh, uh, techniques uh, you can uh, uh, consider for uh, measurement of air pollutants uh, in general for uh, particulates uh, you can use uh, eye volume samplers if you are going for measuring uh, 
24 hour average uh, uh, concentrations uh, the, that is a widely accepted uh, uh, method for measuring the particulates in the ambient environment and uh, the cost is also not very expensive but if you are looking for uh, uh, real time information on uh, a particulates concentration then you have to go for either beta uh, ray attenuation or uh, uh, light scattering based uh, 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 instruments uh, then uh, oxides of nitrogen uh, chumilimilisans you can use it or I, I also mentioned you can also go for uh, uh, absorption based uh, uh, techniques where you can use some solvent to uh, measure uh, 4 hour and 8 hour uh, NO2 and SO2 concentrations. For sulfur dioxide you use uh, UV fluorescence, ozone you can use uh, UV photometry, carbon monoxide you can use uh, NDIR it is widely used uh, uh, technique for measuring carbon dioxide. Uh, for benzene, xylene, toluene, you can we call it as BTX, GC uh, flame photo ionization detectors, you can use it. For uh, total hydrocarbons, uh, you can use a flame ionization detector. So, these are all some, some of the uh, techniques which has been uh, widely used for measuring uh, our, uh, for the air pollutant concentrations in the ambient environment. We'll just give them some time to ask some questions. So, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please let me know uh, before uh, I go for the next okay so uh, i would like to uh, 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 summarize uh, some of the importance of the meteorological how we measure fluctuations um, see this is uh, 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 the fluctuations uh, in the air pollution measurements uh, you should uh, really go for uh, uh, real time uh, uh, measurements uh, then only we will able to get uh, 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 variations in uh, time dependent variations uh, with respect to the uh, pollutant uh, different uh, pollutant concentrations. For example, if you want to measure emissions contributed by vehicles, so then you should go for a real time measurement uh, instrument to capture the, the variations that expect at a site due to the various uh, movement of the vehicle or other industrial activities. So, you should use a continuous uh, uh, ambient uh, measurement instruments that will give you uh, the variations that it, that can you can expect in the given time period. For example, uh, you, the variations the fluctuations can be uh, 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 diurnal. Uh, uh, for, for in this case, if you try to look at uh, on a daytime morning peak hour, afternoon uh, less concentration, again evening less concentration, nighttime less concentration, again. The concentrations in a day in a summer, winter, monsoon and uh, again post monsoon. So, all these characteristics if you want to do it and you should go for a short term uh, 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 frequency observations like for example, one hour, one minute uh, observations will give you some fluctuations. Okay. So, I will move to uh, the other aspects. Uh, if you uh, try to uh, recollect uh, the first uh, slide uh, which I mentioned to you. So, sources. So, these sources will be subjected to meteorology. Transport. So, transport will be subjected to MET parameter and uh, that will be resulting into air quality. Okay. So, we have learnt about uh, the different sources line source or vehicles, then uh, we have industries or you can we call this point source, industries, then uh, area source, so we will call it as an uh, a domestic or a Okay. So, now when the emissions are contributed from these sources, they will be subjected to some transport. Okay. So, the concentrations will be subjected to transport, pollutant concentration subjected to transport depends on meteorological conditions. So, we need to measure the meteorological conditions. What are the important meteorological conditions which affect the air pollutant concentrations? The air pollutant transport from one location to the other locations. So, you need to look at uh, so, you need to measure important is wind speed, 
wind direction temperature and humidity okay so these are all uh, some important uh, meteorological fact parameters that are important to understand how the emissions contributed by the different sources affecting on the air quality so this gives uh, some informations uh, related to the instrumentations uh, which i have used for measurement of uh, meteorological uh, uh, variables so for example cup anemometer so you can use uh, uh, a cup anemometer so it will gives number of rotations where it will indicates the the wind speed in the ambient environment so you can also use uh, the wind vane so basically gives uh, the direction from which the wind is uh, contributing uh, that one then pyrometer will gives uh, the the solar radiations incoming solar radiations at that area then we also have uh, this uh, all these uh, things we have set up in iit madras you can see that ambient air quality monitoring stations with uh, the meteorological sensors which gives uh, a complete uh, real time uh, uh, ambient air quality as well as the meteorological conditions uh, informations uh, have been recorded here okay so i just uh, uh, coming to an end of uh, this uh, you have uh, some of the chapters which i have used for uh, preparing this uh, lectures uh, will be from the book uh, it, it's mostly available in many of the universities pv ro uh, by environmental engineering by pv ro and uh, walk and warner air pollution control then uh, uh, air pollution control legislations again uh, from uh, navras so measurements by stern so these are all the, the some of the books which i have used uh, referred for uh, preparing this lectures so if you have uh, okay so let us uh, try to go by some questions are there okay some first uh, i'll go with uh, question how comparable are the results of conventional high volume sampler with uh, real time uh, monitors okay so basically uh, 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 there will be some variations uh, uh, you will come across with respect to the conventional uh, high volume samplers and if you try to use it for a real time uh, monitors uh, uh, the variations can be uh, about uh, uh, some 10 to 15% uh, depending on the the locations and the height at which you are uh, measuring for example high volume samplers basically used uh, uh, because you will going to collect a large volume of uh, air and uh, Uh, and if you try to look at the the concentration of the pollutant uh, it's more representative uh, whereas in the 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 real time monitor sometimes depending on the wind fluctuations uh, and uh, the data which is getting into the system so you you will have a more accurate accurate in capturing the informations but you all know that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, turbulence uh, that can uh, create uh, variations in in the measurements so i i i, I we had a, uh, some uh, we had some 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 work earlier to compare this uh, uh, conventional uh, high volume sampler with uh, real time monitors and we noticed that the error will be uh, between uh, uh, 10 to 15% so i mean again I, i would like to indicate that it depends on the location and uh, conditions you will going to measure that also alters but we 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 notice about uh, some 10 to 15% variations from uh, about high volume sampler and uh, real time monitors is there any method used for uh, inorganic uh, compounds i think i mentioned about it uh, so for uh, for example uh, you can use the the filters so where you can uh, uh, classify them uh, for uh, uh, you uh, for organic and inorganic uh, compounds so you can use the filter for you extract the filters and uh, subsequently you do analysis for understanding how much is organic and inorganic compounds that are present okay so how are the nuclear uh, uh, air pollutants are measured monitored actually i, I have not uh, uh, come across uh, 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 i mean not i have not involved in uh, doing the measurements of uh, emissions contributed by uh, uh, any of such uh, nuclear uh, uh, emissions contributed by nuclear uh, activities so but there are uh, uh, methods uh, that are available uh, probably I'll, i'll try to uh, get and share with you uh, the, the the type of uh, methods we can adapt for measuring the uh, nuclear uh, uh, emissions contributed to nuclear emissions okay the next question why we need uh, different types of uh, monitoring stations 
So uh, basically, uh, you you you, uh, you have to classify. Uh, you want to compare uh, the measurements, uh, whether it is for at traffic side measurements, because as you all know that uh, uh, traffic side measurements uh, uh, should uh, you will be having different characteristics when compared to a residential characteristics, and maybe uh, uh, emissions contributed by industrial. Uh, Sites. I quickly wanted to show you some graph. We will get a better understanding. Uh, for example, uh, if you are measuring an industrial site, the you assume that uh, the meteorological conditions more or less same. So then, what will happen? Uh, the industrial emissions in general remains constant. You will only notice that there will be an, a slight variations uh, in uh, concentration with respect to time. And uh, similarly, if you are uh, doing at uh, a traffic site, the, the graph may go have some two peaks corresponding to morning and evening uh, uh, emissions. Okay. So then if you do it for a, a residential or a, uh, only at the residential site and you know that a residential site the activities will be morning and maybe in the evening, again you will come across only uh, a morning peak and also maybe in the evening peak like that. So these kind of uh, uh, characteristics you will be able to Locate. So that is why you need to have a different types of stations so that it, it will be easy for you to try and make a comparison uh, and use the data for different assessment. So what is the effect of humidity on pollutants? Which is a very interesting question. So, uh, humidity is a very, very important component uh, in uh, more especially for if you are going for uh, real time uh, monitors. So humidity plays a, a very important role uh, because sometimes uh, some of this uh, uh, light scattering uh, mechanism or, uh, or your absorption uh, uh, radiation mechanism. So this humidity can, water vapor can be an interference. So you need, you generally use a dew humidifier to remove some of this uh, humidity that is existing. So I think uh, uh, humidity plays an important role. So humidity in the ambient environment, that is with respect to measurements. Then coming to an ambient environment, uh, uh, humidity can act as uh, 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 it can enhance uh, sometimes chemical reactions and also uh, it also participate in particle growth. Suppose uh, sometime you will notice some of the finer particles in presence of humidity, they can grow and, uh, and uh, it can lead to an increase in uh, higher concentrations. So that, that is the role the humidity plays. Considering the poor urban air quality increased regular emission, what is the scope for alternative fuels, especially hydrogen. Okay, so uh, I think uh, 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 this can be uh, different uh, management uh, strategy uh, you can look for. Uh, for example, in a, a given area, if you notice that uh, there are one lakh vehicle and 50% uh, are only two wheelers and remaining are contributed, uh, are remaining are uh, uh, four wheeler, uh, uh, diesel vehicle, trucks, buses and uh, uh, your auto rickshaws. Then you can uh, look at it uh, how much uh, uh, if you are converting switching from diesel vehicle to um, uh, CNG or river uh, hydrogen fuel, how it will going to reduce the emissions. So, so th these are all uh, kind of an, a management strategy. I think I will going to touch upon in uh, tomorrow's uh, class. So what are the advantages of cascade impactor? It is a very interesting question. So cascade impactor will able to tell you. Uh, uh, the size distribution that you can expect uh, uh, in the given environment, uh, you can able to understand what are the different sizes of uh, particles uh, uh, existing. You can now, you can relate that information. Uh, each uh, size range uh, will represent a particular source. For example, the combustion related particles in general will be less than 2 micron. So if you notice that uh, more such uh, 2 micron particles in, in overall deposition in the cascade impactor, you can easily uh, uh, relate that these emissions are contributed by combustion uh, uh, activities. So it also gives a, a, a opportunity for you to understand what is the different types of uh, uh, organic and inorganic uh, 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 compounds that are present in the filter paper in the different size ranges. Okay. So one question is on uh, how to uh, quantify the emissions. So let us take uh, uh, one uh, line. So I am taking uh, emissions contributed by vehicles. So assume that there are 10 vehicles. So is out of this 10 vehicles, I am taking uh, 4 bus, 
and four cars and one uh, two wheeler and one three wheeler okay so each of these vehicle drive about 1 km okay so you know an emission factor if it is a bus drives i'm just uh, trying to understand uh, emission factor for uh, uh, say about uh, carbon monoxide i'm just taking it just giving an exam so carbon monoxide i'm just taking uh, an emission factor right now but i'm just quickly to some informations so this will be 4x 4x gram per kilometer so this will be somewhere around 2x gram per kilometer so two wheeler will be say about 0.75 gram per kilometer and this will be uh, uh, 1.1 gram per kilometer okay so now i can i can take this bus the four buses drive for 1 kilometer this is the emission factor so uh, i multiply the emission factor so then i can quantify how much amount of emissions contributed okay so this will be an emission factor so clear so now assume that this bus or car fitted with a, a catalytic converter so this will be an, an emission control measures so if i fit an emission uh, catalytic converter this emission factor will become 1.25 gram per kilometer so now you will get an idea so if i just bring out a sum control within the source okay so then there is a possibility of re reducing the total emissions contributed by these vehicles q will be reduces okay so here activity is nothing but i am just indicated activity as only the vehicle it can be a power plant okay or uh, industry activity so each industry if there is a one industry contributes about 100 tons okay so there are 10 industries means 10 into 100 so that, that is how we will going to uh, uh, quantify okay so again if the industry is having some amount of uh, control mechanism for example electrostatic precipitator or your uh, uh, scrubbing mechanism then correspondingly you will notice that there is a decrease uh, in emissions that are contributing into the system is that clear clear so we have an emission factor activity can be uh, uh, activity can be either vehicle movement industrial activity or domestic activity and this percent control is the control me mechanism that are adapted in the each of the activity okay how to treat uh, air pollution uh, uh, from construction and mining maybe i'll going to discuss in tomorrow's uh, uh, session what is the uh, proportion of pm 2.5 in pm 10 okay this is an interesting question so what is the proportion of pm 2.5 in pm 10 uh, if you notice uh, uh, generally uh, this is a good uh, uh, question so now we will try to uh, look at uh, so you do a measurements at uh, uh, say about uh, at 1.5 meter height so you get uh, uh, you measure the pm10 concentration and if the pm10 concentration is okay say about uh, 100 microgram per meter cube okay so how much is pm2.5 in this so now if you try to look at uh, if the if it is the measurement is very close to a road okay if it is very close to a road what will happens uh, so there will be a significant amount of resuspension and also emissions contributed by the tailpipe so you will notice that roughly about uh, uh, 0.6 to 0 0.8 uh, factor uh, of uh, pm 2.5 60 to 70 percent of pm 2.5 in the uh, uh, in the pm 10 mass okay so if it is a only uh, uh, if you notice suppose if you keep this instrument instead of 1.5 meter and you kept say about say about uh, 20 meter right and probably in this case there is no possibility of uh, getting the uh, large size particles trapping at uh, 10 meter height okay they are 20 meter height then your pm 2.5 proportion uh, in pm 10 will be uh, close to 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 like that okay so again i will going to discuss about uh, this aspects uh, what norms sh should be adapted uh, uh, while uh, construction of uh, uh, buildings to uh, prevent uh, air pollution so all of you know that uh, uh, the construction uh, uh, the emissions contributed by constructions 
uh, at uh, various stages. So sometimes you need to, uh, it is better you contain the air pollutants uh, within the con construction site. For example, uh, generally you need to uh, uh, keep a, 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 a net uh, all around the uh, construction site uh, so that all the emissions will be trapped uh, uh, with uh, that uh, uh, net. The other aspect is you use you should uh, uh, use uh, frequent uh, uh, watering of uh, to avoid uh, uh, sprinkling of water to avoid uh, resuspension of the uh, particles that are generated uh, because of the movement of the vehicles. So those are all some some uh, uh, things you need to uh, practice in order to in order to reduce the emissions contributed by uh, construction activities. Okay, so this is exactly. The other aspect is right now uh, you also know that uh, uh, the construction activity uh, 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 and sometime in the mining. Uh, uh, this is an, uh, a quick example. I can I'll just uh, try to share with you another. Okay, so you, if you have, there is a construction activity here. So now, uh, if the wind is coming from this and uh, uh, you know uh, this is a uh, some some residential area and the construction activity is happening part of the residential area if the wind is coming from here all these dust particles will travel here so what you will do is better you should contain the emissions at this area itself or there is another way is to uh, reduce the the flow of the dust from this area to the other side say they also sometimes use something called wind barriers so they can they can have some wind barriers uh, uh, before the site, okay? So that uh, they can they can avoid transport of all the emissions from the construction activity to away from that, okay? So same same thing they will also adapt in mining. So generally they will try to use a sprinkling system as well as wind barriers in order to deflect the emissions contributed by the various mining activities. Good afternoon, sir. RCP ITM H Pramod Patil. Hello, sir. Uh, hello. Yeah, please. Uh, what are the current measures for eliminating the fugitive dust? What are the current uh, uh, methods uh, for el eliminating fugitive dust? Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the current methods, uh, justly uh, as you know that uh, you you need to uh, sprinkle uh, 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 water in order to avoid resuspension of the dust that are, that are depositing on the road. The next is uh, you can use uh, uh, frequent cleaning. Uh, you can use uh, uh, mechanical scrubbers uh, or uh, mechanical uh, 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 machines to to clean the unpaved roads or uh, are paved roads where a lot of dust is uh, deposited okay then uh, the other thing which i mentioned just now you can use uh, uh, the wind barriers so that you can de deflect the emissions contributed by uh, those kind of activities thank you sir oh, okay of course uh, you can also uh, bring more green cover so green cover is also uh, uh, contain the emissions contributed by fugitive dust uh, I think uh, uh, this is an again uh, another uh, important topic. Uh, if you want to quantify uh, uh, wood burning, generally wood burning can result in uh, basically particulate matter and uh, uh, some hydrocarbons uh, uh, are volatile organic compounds that are existing uh, depending on the type of wood you are using it for uh, fire burning. So, uh, if you uh, would like to know about more on this, uh, maybe uh, uh, you, you need to uh, uh, understand its characteristics because uh, generally uh, depending on the, the type of wood you are going to use, uh, indicate um, the, the particle and size and uh, black carbon. So, some of those uh, 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 compositions you can, you can quantify them. So, uh, in general, in the indoor environment, uh, uh, the ventilation is something which is important and uh, mostly in the rural area if you are using firewood, uh, uh, the, the ventilation will not be that uh, taken care. 
so hence you will have more pollution in the indoor environment uh, uh, in, the, in the especially in the rural uh, uh, kitchens okay p is ut Uh, I want to ask what is the contribution of PM10 con uh, PM10 concentration in the measurement of PM2.5 concentration? Could you could you please repeat? What is the uh, contribution of PM10 con uh, concentration in the measurement of PM2.5 concentration? PM10 concentration in the measurement of PM2.5 concentration. So generally, PM PM10, uh, as the name indicates, any particles less than 10 micron. Okay, so if you are uh, try to look at, if you are going for only PM2.5 concentration measurements, so depending on the location, depending on the sources, it's contributing. So uh, it, it, it indicates that if you PM2.5 is only part particles of size range uh, only uh, less than 2.5 micron. So if it is a PM10 is having 80% uh, uh, PM2.5, so then. Uh, uh, all this PM 2.5 will be contributed um, basically from the local combustion source. Uh, your question is, is it safe to burn uh, rice husk ash, um, rice husk, uh, because uh, uh, in today's uh, uh, concentrating uh, uh, technology, we are using it for production. I think uh, any burning uh, is not good for air pollution. So that is the first thing. Uh, I think uh, uh, we should uh, avoid uh, 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 any open burning of any any uh, any uh, agricultural uh, waste um, uh, because that will contribute significant amount of pollution. So especially if you try to notice um, uh, in Delhi, the, the agricultural burning also contributes significant amount of pollution. So. I th it means it means that uh, we should not uh, uh, use that. But uh, the, the question is uh, uh, how to control them. So, is there any way uh, we can uh, still uh, uh, control them? Uh, maybe you can use some control technology in order to address uh, uh, whenever this agricultural burning is happening. Is there any way we can reduce it? Uh, maybe you can think about thinking that uh, that could be the solution. I think uh, again you need to have uh, some kind of an uh, emission factor for this uh, uh, burning. Uh, uh, you know there are some uh, uh, literatures that are available. Uh, uh, each uh, uh, crop uh, uh, or type of uh, uh, agricultural waste, uh, if you burn it, uh, it will give some amount, uh, some information on how much emissions that are contributing. So you can use that uh, to quantify the emissions contributed by agricultural burning. So there are references that are available, uh, maybe I can share with you if you send an uh, uh, email to me, I can share that uh, 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 details to you. Okay, so uh, regarding uh, uh, your questions uh, on how I the ozone uh, hole in Antarctica, even uh, if there is a less concentration of human populations, you all uh, know that uh, uh, CFCs uh, uh, that were uh, main contributor for uh, destruction of uh, the ozone layer. So these used to transport uh, from, uh, from the urban areas and uh, will all go uh, very close to that uh, uh, Antarctica region. And uh, in, uh, that's why it is uh, uh, causing um, more destruction uh, in ozone layer uh, destruction in that particular area. And second, uh, your question is how common person will participate in controlling uh, air pollution? And this is an uh, another uh, uh, important aspect. Like uh, if you know uh, that if you just uh, do, uh, for example, open burning, open burning uh, is contributing significant amount of air pollution. So if you have a, a kind of an awareness, so you can you can uh, reduce the emissions contributed uh, from the uh, the such activities and uh, the other aspect activities is uh, more uh, like uh, bicycling uh, walking and uh, uh, encouraging uh, mass transport or public transport uh, use of less uh, private uh, vehicles so these are all some of the activities can can common man can participate in order to reduce the emissions 
Okay, are the emission uh, standards are revised? Yes, I think uh, the emissions uh, standards are continuously uh, uh, revised. Um, uh, and also uh, the ambient air quality standards are also revised. As I mentioned to you, uh, there is a cause effect uh, relationship uh, as the new and new informations and technology that are available, ac uh, accordingly they, they revise the emission standards. <laughs> Very interesting question. Is the traffic pollution is uh, predominant uh, due to uh, fuel usage or a bituminous uh, deterioration? I think it's basically because of fuel usage. I, I have not uh, come across uh, how this uh, uh, bituminous uh, layer uh, deterioration uh, 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 increases the, the emissions in that particular uh, area. I think it, maybe I, I, if I want to put your uh, questions in a slightly, uh, is there any uh, 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 road uh, uh, quality deterioration can increases the emissions of course, then that may be I agree with that. So, hence there may be more stop and go operations uh, due to congestion also be because of the bad road, then uh, uh, it increases your fuel usage and then increases the emissions from the vehicles. So, thank you very much uh, for your uh, participation in this session. Okay, thank you.